Independence fighters in West Papua. For over 45 years, these men have been fighting against the Indonesian military in their struggle for freedom. West Papua lies 250 kilometers north of Australia on the western half of the island of New Guinea. It has been under Indonesian military occupation since 1962 and remains in the midst of a bitter independence struggle. Foreign journalists and human rights observers are banned from entering West Papua by the Indonesian authorities. I travelled undercover, aided by members of the independence movement. Despite being a land of stunning natural beauty, the reality of life in the majority of Papuans is harsh. They have suffered years of oppression and hardship under Indonesian military occupation. It is estimated that at least half a million Papuans have been killed by the Indonesian security forces since the occupation began, bearing stark similarities to the atrocities committed by Indonesia in East Timor. Thousands of others have fallen victim to human rights abuses and stories of intimidation, rape and torture are widespread. I spent two months travelling undercover, meeting members of the independence movement as well as political prisoners and human rights victims. Each had their own story to tell of life under Indonesian occupation and their determination for West Papua to be free. I was on my way to meet independence fighters at their stronghold deep in the jungle. With all forms of political opposition to Indonesian rule banned, an underground people's liberation movement was formed in 1965. Known as the Organisasi Papua Medeka, it incorporates various wings, including militants. In order to avoid detection by the Indonesian military, I travelled for over two days on foot along perilous mountain routes and through thick jungle to reach the camp of the rebel stronghold. A traditional smoke signal set up at dawn, the only means of sending a message across the valley, letting the camp know the impending arrival of friends, not foe. As we drew closer, those escorting me broke into song, their melodies reassuringly welcoming. Misunderstandings could be fatal. Response, a distant gunshot from the camp. Permission granted. <laughs> Upon our arrival, villagers gathered and started charging around the ceremonial grounds in a state of trance connecting to the spirits of their ancestors and giving thanks for our safe arrival. Uh, 
Eh, Pak Tuhan. Eh, stay, Bapak. Kami dia mau dia mau buka dia jemuran ular ada yang mana? Kami. Kami dia, kami dia, kami dia. I was the first Westerner allowed by the rebels to visit their camp. I was to gain a deeper moving insight into their struggle, their rich traditions, proud way of living, and determination for West Papua to be free. West Papua's integration into the Indonesian archipelago in the early 1960s is highly controversial. West Papua had been granted full independence by the Dutch Empire in 1961, but was subsequently invaded by Indonesia 12 months later. The United Nations intervened and instigated that an act of self-determination, known as the Act of Free Choice, should take place in order to determine West Papua's future. The vote itself did not meet international standards, out of a population of nearly 1 million, only 1,000 tribal elders were allowed to vote. Many would later tell of how they had been rounded up by the Indonesian military and forced at gunpoint to vote in favour of integration. I was taken to a rebel hideout five hours away in the jungle, where another clan had come to meet me. Papuans do not look like other Indonesians. They are Melanesian, ethnically closer to the Australian Aboriginals. Papuans share no ethnic, cultural or historical ties with Indonesia, despite Indonesian claims to the contrary. Many of those I spoke with told of how they regarded the camp as a sanctuary where they could live a traditional way of life away from the fast-changing socio-climate that has developed under Indonesian rule. Others told stories of how they had fled their villages following Indonesian military sweeping operations and had sought refuge at the camp where they knew they would be safer. In many parts of Papua now, the indigenous population is outnumbered by migrants from other parts of Indonesia. Many of these migrants regard the Papuans and their traditional ways of living backward and primitive. Layers of resentment have built up over the years. <laughs> The majority of West Papua's 250 tribes continue to live a subsistence lifestyle that has changed little in thousands of years. People cook using outdoor ground ovens and survive on a staple diet of sweet potatoes and wild pig. The legacy of Indonesian rule and the activities of their notoriously brutal military 
have had devastating consequences upon the Papuan people and their way of life. The majority of Papuan freedom fighters still fight with traditional weapons like bows and arrows. They possess a fearlessness and knowledge of the land that has made them a thorn in the side of the Indonesian military. I asked these young men why they were fighting for Papua Freedom. What were their hopes and aspirations for the future? Against the backdrop of the outlawed West Papua national flag, battle practice was a daily occurrence on the camp ceremonial ground. The independence fighters are aware of the need to prepare for attacks by the Indonesian military. <laughs> Behind their cries for freedom are a people who are deeply wounded from years of oppression and displacement under Indonesian rule. <laughs> The resistance to Indonesian rule is poorly armed. The limited guns and ammunition held by these independence fighters are the result of raids carried out on Indonesian police and army posts. Their power lies as much in their symbolism than in their ability to wage war. They are hopelessly outnumbered and outarmed by the huge Indonesian military buildup in the region. It is a buildup that has made West Papua one of the most heavily militarized zones in the Asia Pacific region. This guerrilla unit is led by one of the most wanted men in Indonesia, General Goliat Tabuni. <laughs> Ini kodap satu, kodap dua, kodap tiga, kodap empat, kodap lima, kodap enam, kodap tujuh, berapa kodap? Sembilan tu. Sembilan tapi tidak ada yang berangkara. Ima kau yang nak lihat nak urin yang berangkara. Dia yang kau yang orang lagi kambing yang tu. Tiada dah kalau yang orang itu. Semua pintu sebelah, pintu sebelah masuk, pintu sebelah, pintu depan keluar itu merdeka. Tapi pintu dapur masuk itu otonomi. Mata mi itu tak tidak mau. Antara kandiri, anda orang datang bapura orang ada mobil kenaan, anda wen dengan dua tingkat, yang kaya lima puluh juta kan bohong dengan orang dua orang yang orang pegang pun orang aja, eh pun orang aja mana, dia kaya betera, dia nak urin nama dia tuan tapi orang nak bunga tak, dia nak, anak urin nama, pura kini balai nanti, kaya orang kini balai nanti, pakai wajah, game dia dia, ni ni beli orang ni dia, 
Benin and Guadu Gunata. Tell Anber and Gray. On 1st of December, clans gathered at the camp for West Papua's Independence Day. It was on this day that the Dutch Empire granted West Papua their independence. There is no greater sign of cultural identity than a flag. It is illegal for West Papuans to raise their national flag. Such is the level of cultural oppression under the Indonesian regime that there are people serving 15 year prison sentences for doing so. As people gathered and sang the outlawed West Papua national anthem, soldiers from the OPM raised their national flag. Proud traditions passionate defiance. <laughs> a symbolic burning of Indonesian flags by villagers, a universally recognized sign of discontent at the continued Indonesian occupation of their land and a message to the outside world that the independence aspirations of the Papuan people burn strong. It was an act that sent many into ecstatic displays of charging around the ceremonial ground. consequences of a possible war of independence are never far from people's minds. Future fears lamented. What will we do when our husbands are all killed by the Indonesian military, sing the ladies in the rebel camp. <laughs> Sangi <laughs> ginare 
Back in the state capital Jayapura, I was driven by independence activists to a freedom camp set up by the gravestone of the West Papua independence leader Thais Lue. He was assassinated by Indonesian special forces in 2001. In a makeshift tent beside his grave, video projectors showed footage of human rights abuses committed by the Indonesian military against Papuans. Boards laden with images of torture victims were also on display. This was a very brave and public show of defiance against the Indonesian regime. Less than 24 hours after I shot these images, this camp had been stormed by the Indonesian military. Many of those present had been taken away on army trucks and not seen since. <laughs> One of West Papua's best-known political prisoners is Yusak Bakage. He is currently serving a 10-year prison sentence for his part in a peaceful flag-raising ceremony in 2004. He is recognised as a prisoner of conscience by Amnesty International. I'm Yusak Bakage. Now I'm staying in the Habibura Hospital. And uh, I come um, of an uh, Indonesian prison in Habibura. Bakage had fallen ill in his prison cell and been taken to hospital. I was taken to meet him while I recorded this interview in secret. Uh, first December 2004, I and my people take up to uh, take up a uh, West Papua flag. Uh, this is a uh, bintang kejora, and uh, I and uh, Pribalma and Indonesia was uh, catch to us. Uh, they sent us to the Indonesian prison in Abipura. December 20, uh, 2004, until now I stay in. Uh, Abipura prison, especially uh, England and uh, USA and Australia must, must have uh, support to us and uh, must to free. In October 2008, a group of influential politicians led by exiled West Papua independence leader Benny Wenda converged on the Houses of Parliament in London for the launch of international parliamentarians for West Papua. Patrick Kennedy. Um, writes, Dear Mr Smith, Papuan seeking... This group is actively developing the political and legal framework towards the goal of forcing the United Nations to rerun the bitterly contested act of free choice. The important date is August 1969 when Indonesia held the act of self-determination, ironically called the act of free choice. Perhaps we could just consider what actually happened in the act of free choice. 1,026 people were handpicked by the Indonesian government, less than 0.2% of the population. There was no vote by the 1,026 people. They had to reach decisions by a Javanese system known as Musyawara, consensus. This does not allow dissent or opposition. This discussion took place in the presence of the army, the information services and the government. It was not a valid exercise of self-determination. It's an established principle of international law that a colonial people have a right to independence. They have a right to the restoration of their inherent sovereignty that was illegitimately taken by a colonial <coughs> power. And as you know, colonialism is contrary to the Charter of the United Nations and it is therefore illegal. Recent developments like the International Parliamentarians for West Papua have helped to raise West Papua on the international media and political agenda. It has renewed hope amongst members of the Free Papua movement that freedom is finally within their grasp.
is left in no doubt that the fight for freedom for these proud people will continue until West Papua is once again a free nation. The scars of the past will never fully heal, but whilst there remains hope, anything remains possible. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah.